to you the referee in charge of this bout, Mills Lane. All right, fans, here we go. This is it, the main event of the evening, 12 rounds of boxing, the IBF middleweight championship of the world. Introducing to you first, the challenger on my left, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing light blue trunks with white trim, and fighting out of Hartford, Connecticut. His weight tonight is already 158 pounds, with a record of 45 wins, five defeats, and one draw. He has 27 wins by way of knockout. Please welcome the WBC welterweight champion of the world, the challenger known as Marlon Magic Man Starling. Across the ring is the defending champion fighting out of the red corner. Entering the ring wearing white trunks with black trim and fighting out of the Ten Goose Boxing Club in North Hollywood, California by way of Davenport, Iowa. His weight tonight is an even 160 pounds. His outstanding record, 34 wins, no defeats, 23 wins by way of knockout. He is the undefeated IBF middleweight champion of the world, Michael, second to none. <laughs> Referee in charge now to give instructions and bills and lane. All right, now you've already gone through the instructions in the dressing room one time. Any questions from the challenger's corner? No, sir. Any questions from the champion's corner? Let's get it on, come on. As Damon Runyon said, the race usually goes to the swift and the battle to the strong. But where Marlon Starling is concerned, he knows how fast his head is and how strong his heart is. Round one begins. Ray Leonard, you suggest that you didn't like the way Nunn looked in his corner before the fight. It was a very, very uh, unsure look. He didn't look too positive. Normally, Michael Nunn gets to the ring and has this arrogance about him. I don't see it now. With Marlon Stalin, because he's fighting a heavier weight, he didn't have to exert himself to make the 147-pound weight limit. He was able to train and relax too. This is Vintage Starling. He's talking already. He pushed Nunn into a corner and tried to aggravate him. He's been doing it throughout this, uh, since they've been here. He's been trying to make Michael Nunn mad so Mike, in fact, would try to fight his fight inside. And as Starling entered the arena today, he went by the trailer which served as Nunn's dressing room and banged on the door and started yelling, come on, get out here. Hear what I said about clowning. So Michael's against the ropes. He did it against Ira and Barkley. And Barkley telegraphed his punches. With Starling, Starling's punches a lot shorter and a lot more accurate. Starling's a much more technically skilled fighter than Iran Barkley. The size disparity, on the other hand, is readily apparent in the ring. Nunn looks down at Starling. Marlon Starling has an incredible style, very unique, I must say. He keeps those hands up, very, very high, and he's able to de deliver punches. Those are the uppercuts that Michael Nunn is throwing. And those uppercuts could be powerfully important against the peekaboo defense. Well, they work very well because I, I think also a punch like Tyson throws to the uh, liver and then the uppercut because you have, a, you have to disguise that punch. are landing punches inside. Most of the punches thrown by Nunn is being caught on the hands and the elbows of Marlon Stalin. It's a very difficult defense to penetrate. You see what's happening here, Jim? Marlon's walking his man down. 
He's throwing that lead off right. The right hand works well against southpaws. You'll notice they throw it from time to time. And in the last 30 seconds, Starling has begun to land frequently, and he seems to have none a little bit befuddled. Watch the right hand. There it is again. The most noticeable thing in that round is that Michael Nunn was standing flat-footed. Apparently, he's decided to try to impose his greatest strength on the welterweight champion. We'll see if he can do it. You do on asserting yourself. Just keep hitting the body more. Okay. Okay. Just be aware on the inside. Mike, is this guy a piece of cake or what on the inside? Okay. If you're gonna stay on the inside, keep dominating. Use the jab from the outside a little bit more, though. Okay. Hey, pretty much you're doing what you want to do with the guy. Just don't get lazy in there with okay. him. Don't let him keep getting off. The right hand's working for you, okay? Now just use those paints, okay? Mm -hmm. On more paints out there, it'll make the right hand work a little easier, okay? And the jab's working well, too. Starling's corner is Freddie Roach, a disciple of Eddie Futch, 30-year-old former featherweight. He was working with Futch at the time when Starling rid himself of Futch's services, but he said, Freddie's just fine, I'll keep him. The punch count statistics for round one reflected what you said, Ray, that Starling was picking off most of Nunn's punches with his gloves and his forearms. And this trainer, Freddie Roach, told Starling to keep throwing the right hand. There it is again. And also, like to reiterate on Larry, Michael Nunn is standing straight up. He's not bending at all. There's the right hand again. It's gonna cut, it's gonna connect every time. Get him up. Come on, Molly. Get him well, it up. did against Hunnigan. Nunn presents a much bigger picture in there than does Lloyd Hunnigan. What I see here is Stalin is far more relaxed than Michael. Michael now is turning to orthodox, which I've never seen him do. And Starling in return turns to Southpaw. Uh, have a body attack. I have yet to see body attacks. There was one punch there. Muscle mm -hmm. arm punches. And you heard Joe Goosen between rounds urging Nunn to go to the body, but that's not what he's doing now. Wailing away at Starling's gloves. Keep watching that right hand, Jim. He's snapping Nunn's head back with the right hand. These punches thrown by Michael Nunn is not going to get any type of respect from Marlon Stalin. He needs to put some body behind those punches. hand again by Stalin. He's trying to set him up. The hand closed. Unless none remembers to go to the body, he may get awfully arm weary banging away against Starling's gloves. Like right hand again. And again after the bell. I thought that was a nice round for none. He found a good rhythm found the distance that he could jab effectively okay, you get busy around and you okay? started to work off the jab. Take the action away from you, okay? You gotta yeah. be busier, all right? Give me Give me a spit bucket. All right? 
looking off like uh, 12 rounds, okay? okay? Now you can pick the pace up. You can't give rounds away. Let's win them all, okay? All right? A little lazy that round, okay? Yeah. More punches, okay? Uh -huh. You don't have to be real tight out there. Just there's, there's a lot of snap in your punches, okay? Quick. Just a little bit. I think when you bump heads in there. Yeah, we bump heads, yeah. Keep using that jab, though, Mike. When you keep them from the outside, use the jab, slide the uppercut. That's what's working from the outside. On the No, let me keep it on here. On the inside, Mike, body and pivot around them. We can't play, baby. We can't play. It's no, Step back in the ice. It appears that Nunn already has a slight swelling over his right eye. Very few tall, skinny fighters become dominant fighters. I can think of uh, Tommy Hearns, uh, Bob Foster, the old uh, light heavyweight champion. And there's a question if, if uh, he keeps fighting this kind of fight, whether he can take punishment for 12 rounds. Now, this is really uncharacteristic of uh, Michael Knight. He's putting his head down and is trying to be a slugger. Watch the uppercuts from Marlon Stalin. Nothing's happening here. Stalin's blocking those shots. A couple shots got in. Michael Knight has yet to figure out the style of Stalin. The right hand once again. But when he throws the right hand, when Stalin throws the right hand, he needs to come back with the left hook. Follow up with something. Keep it close, come on. <laughs> My trainer, Pepe Carrero, has told me that one punch can land, the other punch can land too. Ray, why is he changing from southpaw to right hand back and forth. What is he getting out of that? I never, what, what is he trying to confuse this man? I don't know. But if something works, Larry, you don't stop. Nunn digs through the body to get off the ropes. Starling had complained before the fight that he did not want to see loose ropes in this ring because Nunn likes to lean against them and lean back and work off of that. No one was able to do I'm what Joe cold. told him to do in the corner. Throw punches, then, then pivot. Oh, 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 that's the first time behind the neck. Come on, come on, come on. He did that, but he didn't throw any more punches after that. Mills Lane warning the fighters not to hold and hit. None has a tendency to reach out with his right hand and hold the back of Starling's head. Starling ripping with the right hand again, and again, and again. Three right hands landed. That He's right hand is the bread and butter for Marlon Stalin. These are not hard right hands, but they're landing with unerring accuracy. And Ray, as you pointed out before the fight in your tip of the night, the right hand is always effective against the southpaw if you find this place for it. If it lands, keep throwing it, but come back with something else, a left hook. Well, guys, already after three rounds, we've had more action than a lot of people expected after 12. So this is turning out to be not just a tactical fight, but also a good deal of, of action. You've got to go to that body more, Mike. Jimmy, where's the bucket? Mike, look, when he's going into that, into that shell, go to the body, dig those punches, and work around them. Turn them, and then use those uppercuts, Mike. That's what will catch this guy. Let's see Nunn try to penetrate that peekaboo defense. He's having a hard time. It can be a little frustrating, and you got to be careful not to wear yourself out trying because, as you see there with Starling sticking his tongue out, he's trying to inspire Nunn to just keep throwing punches. Neither of them apparently has the firepower to hurt the other so far. If any one of them uh, hurts the other, it will be through attrition. And indeed, chosen, both have chosen to indicate to the other that they can't be hurt under these circumstances. By punch count statistics against Iran Barkley in a fight in which people thought he didn't look all that great, none landed more than 50% of his punches. He's landing about 20% of his offerings against Starlin. 
That right and left a moment ago might have been the best combination so far in the evening for Nunn. That left landed. He's finally beginning to get past Starling's peekaboo defense. It's been a tough time for referee Mills Lane to uh, pull these two apart. There is no love loss here. I can't believe Stalin's not going to the body of Michael Nunn. Look at the body, it's so exposed. Hey, Mooch, you're giving him the round. Come on, let's get busy. Come on, Mooch. Let's play two. Starling's corner yelling for him to throw punches. They say he's giving none the round. And there he comes with uppercuts. Stalin has thrown some pretty good right hand. Not powerful right hand, but they were very accurate. The problem he's making, he's not throwing his combinations. He's not putting his punches together. I don't like it when Michael Nunn stays straight up erect. Nunn dominating the action of this round. Now you see Stalin, he retaliates. And when he throws, a bunch, throws his punches in bunches, you see how many land. Right hand once again, Jim. Right on the chin. Nunn starting to work more and more effectively with the jab. Starling has given him more opportunities in this round. Well, that was a warning by Mills Lane for a low blow. In fact, Joe Goosen was telling Michael to go to the body a lot more. But Michael selects it, go to the head. I prefer Mike to stay in the head because when he goes down, he puts his head down. And when he does that, Starling hits him with the right hand. Well, we've had Douglas Tyson, we've had Chavez Taylor, and now we have Nunn Starling. We're on a roll, and One more. sometimes it's All infectious, right, you when you but when you get two champions, you, okay, you don't know what to expect. Side, okay? All right, Mucci, go stand right in front of this guy. Combination is off to the side, okay? Very good, Mucci. Let's go. Win those exchanges, okay? Harold Letterman, our unofficial official, how do you have it? Well, Larry, I've got it 39 to 37, three rounds to one in favor of Michael Nunn. Basically, we score fights on clean punching, effective, aggressive, and this ring generalship and defense, and I think Michael Nunn has been the faster, more effective, cleaner puncher with the left hand so far. Right over there. Gotcha. All right, so start Harold, a I have the score line. the same way. Once I can't say I can separate it into all those categories, however. <laughs> <laughs> If Michael Nunn can keep doing what he's doing, that is to say, if, if his conditioning holds up, which has been questioned, then he's found the formula to dominate this fight. <laughs> Stalling just told Michael Nunn that he's hard to hit. Yeah. <laughs> he said, I'm hard to hit. Hard <laughs> You talk about no love lost, Ray. I can't imagine any opponent liking Starling. He's a pest. He's a great guy. He's a character, I'll tell you that. A punch that I used to play with in the gym was an overhand right. Not a straight right hand, but an overhand right, especially against a tall opponent. Roundhouse right from Starling fell short. None starting to become more effective inside. Nunn is fighting this way. When he comes in this way, he has a tendency to put his head down, Jim. 
And in doing so, he's very susceptible to shots thrown by the short of uh, Marlon Stalin. Well, Larry and Harold both having win have him winning three or four rounds, and you can't believe he's fighting this way. You see the fight differently? Well, I, I just see that uh, Stalin has been throwing more punches, although the hand speed of, of Michael Nunn sometimes has a tendency to mesmerize you. That's why I'm not a judge. This may be a tough fight for judges to evaluate. And two of them are the two judges who gave Nunn his victory over Iran Barkley in Reno in August. seems to be slowing down. He needs to stay a lot busier. Well, the first minute of this round, Starling was busy and none slowed down. But now in the ensuing two minutes, the middleweight has taken over again. None having free reign now to fire away at Starling. What's happening, when Stalin throws one punch and Michael throws a combination, Michael Nunn will steal the round. An excellent round for Curry. There used to be a saying that a fighter like a uh, leopard a can't change his spots, but Michael Nunn on. is changing his style and standing in there and jab, fighting. Maybe because Starling can't hurt him, he has the courage to do that. Mike. Mike, keep using the jab. You'll find stuff off of it, Mike. Keep boxing him. Change his body weight, okay? More veins, okay? Go to him, sit to him. Don't pull away from any shots, okay? No time to fool around out there, okay? Go to work, okay? Let's get that body. Pick it up. Rip that body. Outside and in. This combination is inside. You get to fire him, okay? Earlier today, WBA middleweight champion Mike McCallum stopped Michael Watson. And there are some ramifications of that. You won't believe who the mandatory challenger for the championship, middleweight championship you're now looking at is. It's Donald Curry. He's only fought two middleweights in his life, neither one of whom we've ever heard of. <laughs> but indeed, according to the rules of the International Boxing Federation, the winner of this bout must give Donald Curry a match before July 17th this year should throw in here, Jim, that fellow named Roberta Duran is still a WBC middleweight champion. <laughs> you heard of him, haven't you, Ray? <laughs> <laughs> the name does ring a bell, Larry. And Starling's people have indicated that if they can get by this one and Starling can take the middleweight title, he would like to fight Duran. Mike, Michael Nunn's gonna find that throwing two jabs would open something up. There will be an opening after two jabs. None switched to conventional for a while, now goes back to the southpaw stance. So he goes from throwing left jabs, of which he landed the two in a row that you were looking for, to right jabs. Coming with the left off of it, and here, now Mike's trying to, Mike's clowning here. And this is when Stalin should, should jump in there. just a lot more tentative than he was in the first few rounds, Ray. Could it be that the bigger man's size and weight have gotten to him a little bit? If the fight a bigger man does wear you down, when you're leaning on each other, the bigger man comes out on top. It's a matter of size here. Now Michael Nunes wants you to body. None dominating the action here. 
Well, Starling, for the time being, has stopped throwing punches again. Very good trick there, stepping on the foot of a taller opponent. Often happens when a conventional fighter faces a southpaw. What uh, Starling's doing, he's actually giving away this round. In fact, he's giving away a couple rounds. He certainly hasn't shown any indication of trying to win this one. And for a man who's been out of the ring 242 days, none now showing little if any sign of ring rust. Okay, Mucci, now you gotta fire it up in there, okay? Come on, stop ripping that body, both hands, okay? Come on, you're giving these rounds away, okay? They're too close, all right? Now you gotta pick it up out there, okay? You gotta rip that body hard, okay? You gotta pick up the pace now, fight this guy, okay? Come on, you're halfway there, okay? Let's go, let's get this guy tight, let's rip that body. Open up, this son of a bitch, okay? Come on, open up. Let's go now, Mucci. all in front of him. Now you're working. Now you keep you keep popping them like that. You keep popping them like that for the next few rounds, Mike. Then you're gonna find your openings, okay? Your box is smart now. Gotcha. You understand exactly what I'm saying? Yeah. Here we go. Okay. Let go, Jim. Freddie Roach keeps saying okay, 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 but his fighter Marlon Starling is not okay right now. You have the impression Starling never listens to anything in his corner. Well, he's his own manager, isn't he? <laughs> there you go. He doesn't have to if he doesn't want to. But he really needs to be busy here. He needs to throw more punches, get a lot more serious. The man who's been doing all the talking in Nunn's corner is Joe Goosen, who just returned to the Nunn camp from his three-week exile overnight. Now Starling begins to go to the body and become more aggressive, as Freddie Roach had urged him to do. standing straight up just waiting for that punch Marlon is still throwing the right hand Freddie Roach Marlon is trying to wash two hands I think that not Stalin was hurt there he was rattled for a second live off balance Starling at a standstill Michael Nunn is just having a field day. It's a picnic. You see what happens, Jim, when, when, when Marlon Stein throws combinations? He's a lot more effective. But one punch is not going to get it with the guy with the foot and hand speed of Michael Nunn. Starling, after an interesting first three rounds, has drifted south. Less and less active, more and more willing to let Nunn control the bout with his jab and his boxing skills. And now these punches are getting through the peekaboo defense. I think what's happening out there, Jim, is Starling, knowing he's behind, has to take more chances. He's going to be more vulnerable, and he might get 
hit with some heavy punches. Right, those shots and then we never come right to the chin, okay? Harold Letterman, we'll right up how's the fight progress right according to you? Larry, I've got it 69 to 64, six rounds to one in favor of Michael Nunn. I mean, in plain and simple English, Michael Nunn has come to fight and Marlon Starling hasn't. For some reason, as I see the fight, Marlon just is not throwing punches, he's laying back, and he's letting Michael Nunn whack him continuously with good straight left hands. And Michael Nunn is totally dominating this fight. Snap him hard, baby. You got to really no argument, put him in Harold. Like, <laughs> came up with those uppercuts. I see this more as a fight, not between a heavier man and a, and a less heavy man, but between a tall, skinny guy and a short, compact guy. And the tall, skinny guy's winning. And it isn't a question of his strength either. It's his youth, his quickness, and his reach. And we'll see now if Starling opens up. He's trying that little trick again, step on the foot. And that is the case, like you stated earlier, Jim, by the tall guy, Southpaw, unorthodox. Nunn casually looking down at his front foot, as if to say, all right, I'll watch it if you're gonna try to step on it. It's an old story in boxing to see the smaller, quicker man against the bigger, heavier puncher. But as you charted Starling's disadvantages coming into this fight, it was unusual to note that he was going up against a bigger, quicker man. If I was in Starling's corner, I would just tell him to just go out there and fight. He's not gonna win this fight trying to outbox Michael Nunn. Nunn has too many advantages with the height, being a southpaw, being quick, and being younger. Ray, why is Michael Nunn, after being so successful standing toe-to-toe, -to -toe, suddenly started to dance around the ring? Well, I think it's, it's safer from his standpoint because, again, the style of Marlon Stahl coming with his head. He does throw more punches like now, inside. But he also has a chance to set his man up on the outside. But it is when Nunn goes into retreat and begins to dance around the ring like that that his marketability comes into question. The Barkley fight proved one thing. It proved that he won't satisfy the public simply by winning fights. Well, again, if, he, if he's just trying to just satisfy the public and not stick to the right formula, it could be fatal for him. So you're saying it ought to be enough for him to win fights. It just, exactly, Jim. When you do what he's got you thus far. I mean, Michael Nunn does not have the body to, to be a puncher, inside puncher. I think once he wears his opponent down, that's then it's, it's safe to go inside, but not at the early stage. The question has always been, would none make it to a level where the public would compel people like Ray Leonard to have to fight him? There's always talk, Jim. But I think he has nothing to contend with here against Starling. Starling coming alive, landed a right cross inside. Now none comes back with a fury of his own. Starling gives away too many rounds. A good action round. Good. good. But Starling needs 13. more than that. He ain't gonna take much more of this. You got 9, 10, 11, and 12. Sit back. Let me get some water on you. Relax. Jimmy, leave that alone right now. Come on, that's right. None, see, none. I see. One, two, step to you. Look into his eyes now. I'm telling you right now, he was fading that round. He was fading big time. You had him hurt, Mike. He had one flurry in that whole round. You had him hurt two, three times with those flurries. Once you daze him, none, you got to keep on him. Okay, here is a good toe to toe exchange as Starling opened up, landed something good inside, and took one almost at the same moment from the fast handed none.
So it becomes another display of Nunn's multiple skills. And Starling has to climb out of a hole. doing his <laughs> infamous clowning. Yeah, and you said before the fight that he shouldn't clown. Look, he's always at risk when you clown like this, especially when a fighter is capable of throwing a big punch. Wins him no points from the judges. Look what he's doing here. Wins him no love and appreciation from the fans. And the booing begins. Michael Knight has incredible hand speed, and that's what's so impressive about him. And you notice, Joe, every time that Michael has a tendency to show bold or either box, he gets really booed by the, by the crowd, and it really bothers him, too. And I think it bothers Marlon Stalin. It really doesn't help a fighter's morale because he wants to be impressive. He wants to be good. He wants to be great. Well, what fight fans want from Nunn is both fair and unfair. Most of all, they want him to go about his business without self-glorification and without the clowning. That's fair. They also want him to produce knockouts, and that, to a certain degree, may be unfair. Exactly, I would agree with that, Jim. I mean, Michael Nunn is not your one-punch knockout. Either. Michael Nunn is a boxer. If you if you really observe Michael Nunn's punches, I mean, they come in bunches, come in like four or five punch combinations. But you'll notice that his punches, he punches with his arms, with speed, not with body. And the booing begins again. He excited the boxing public in the weeks following his one-round, one-punch knockout of Sumbu Kalimba. All of that excitement dissipated in the 12-round decision over Barker. That fight there with Colin Bay, because Colin Bay was such a highly recognized fighter and champion, it was like a sin for him to have knocked out Colin Bay with one punch. Because now he has to up to the expectations. I thought Starling uh, won that round. It's been a long time since he's won one in uh, my card. But you can't afford to give him any part of the round, all right, because it's too close. Only because you fucked around, you let him in the fight a little bit. Now listen to me, Mike. He's got his hands up so high, you either got to come up the middle or you got to go around to the body. Sit back and take a deep breath. Come more to the solo places. Good shot, okay? And come back with the left hook right hand, okay? Yeah. Threes and four punch combination, not one at a time, okay? All right? Let's go. Get the hook right up again, okay? The hook right up against it's gonna work against this guy now, okay? Shot. Take it. You know what I'm saying, Mike? Okay. He's got the hands up, you gotta come up the middle on him when you're inside. You gotta hit the liver, you gotta hit the body, gotcha. but you gotta get in there with a jab left hand. Body, okay? Then the hands, you'll come in for the headshots, okay? If there's any problem in conditioning with none, it might have showed in that last round, but I, I can't honestly say that I see him as tired yet. That clowning usually is to buy time. there he knows it's for him you'll notice that michael now will become aggressive all of a sudden because of the reaction of the crowd the crowd at times plays a, a significant role in one's performance if not put out enough and the crowd start booing you you will become a lot more active i don't think the crowd is uh, is booing none i think they want to see more action they want to see more competition uh, 
but I think that's up to Starling to do something about this. They could probably be booing both fighters. <laughs> I think you're wrong. I think they're in the habit of booing none now. I think it's a habit that developed as a result of the Barkley fight and all the abuse he took in the media and from fans as a result of that. You may be right. If Marlon Stars can ever throw an overhand right, a Ken Norton right hand, is now or never. Good punch by Michael Nunn. Michael Nunn, he turns his head, he anticipates a right hand. Now, what, what Stars should do is back off and get some leverage here. kind of shots that slows a big man down. Those shots to the body. Drill those shots to the midsection. It may be a little late, though, for Starling to be working to the body and trying to slow none down. That might have been a better idea back in rounds three and four. Solid left hand from Starling, but he's landed enough with the right hand to show that he probably can't hurt none. But also, Jim, I must, must be fair, it's tough to look good against Ball and Stalin, too. And to a growing chorus of boos, Nunn returns to his corner where Joe Goosen works while trying to forget about a great disappointment for him that took place earlier today. The Goosen camp is developing a young fighter named Gabriel Ruelas. 130-pound fighter, 21-0, coming into his battle today with journeyman Jeff Franklin. And Franklin was able to score a technical knockout, stopping Ruelas' unbeaten streak because of an elbow injury that Ruelas developed in the middle of a fight he was thoroughly dominating. Watch this slow motion, and you'll see how Franklin was able to yank Ruelas' elbow. This is one round after Ruelas had made it clear to ringside observers that he could no longer punch with the right hand. He had won the first six rounds and seemed for much of that time on the verge of a knockout. Now he has a loss on his record. He has gone to the hospital, and the diagnosis is not yet forthcoming, though the people in the Goosen camp believe it is at least a dislocation and perhaps even a fracture. One of the most sensational-looking young fighters I've seen in a long time. He has a hurdle to clear now, and it will make him a better fighter down the road if he does. There's chanting in the crowd. It sounds to me as though some people are chanting Michael and some are chanting Starlet. So at least the interest is still here. Starling lands a right hand and a lot of people wake up. Marlon Stone needs to get going now. He needs to throw more punches here. This is when you reach down, Jim. This is when you bring up that special little magical resource. There is no reason for Stalin to be backing away. What he should be doing is going forward. There's such a uh, significant difference in the size of Stalin and Michael Nunn. Because Michael Nunn carries away a lot better and much more of a full-fledged middleweight than Marlon Stalin. Here he's just measuring Stalin and taking pop shots, just picking his shots. Nunn's great hands and feet, giving him a chance to dominate yet another round. 
Stalling is getting lazy, just laying back, relying on one punch, where we see Michael Nunn just putting his hands together. Punch after punch. Stalling has landed three left hands right on the kisser, but they don't bother Nunn, who is standing in to try to deliver more punishment. fight. Neither fighter seemingly in danger of leaving the ring anytime soon. My guess, Jim and Ray, is that the people who are unhappy with There's Nunn's so performance more, here in Las Vegas are those people like who bet the fight down from go. six to one to three to one. There you they go. bet on Starling I because I think again. Michael Nunn looks pretty minutes. good right here. This is for your birthday. <laughs> sit Close back. Sit back and take a couple deep breaths now. Okay. Now, Mushi, he punches when he's punching. You punch with them, okay? He's two outside. You're right down the middle. One, two, one, two, okay? Fire straight in the heart now. He's just... As you can this round, put hooks after uppercuts after left hands. When you stun him, stay on him. You look good at one, two. Get up now, Mucci. Straight. Straight punches, okay? Because he knows there's a jab over him right first thing, okay? All right, go out there. Ping, ping. Hard. Hard, Mucci, okay? Pick it up now. Harold, last going round. into this minutes. last round, how do you see it? Larry, eight rounds to three. 107, 102, Michael Nunn. He's just too quick, just landing too many hard left hands. What we're saying here is that Michael Nunn is still the middleweight champion, and Marvin Sterling is still the welterweight champion. Starling had hoped for a future path out of the welterweight division. He doesn't much want to fight WBA welterweight champ Mark Breland for a third time. Also, no one wants to fight Simon Brown. Another one of the welterweight champions. Simon Brown has a problem. Everyone avoids him. He's too good. He's that good. And also, right now, Starling needs to be good. Good right hand, once again by Stalin. That overhand right is the one that knocked out Mark Freeland in Columbia, South Carolina. That was the right hand that I was talking about earlier that bothers those tall southpaws. Because it comes on the blind side. You can't see it coming. Crowd is chanting Marlon, Marlon. Something. All he's doing is working his way in. He's not throwing anything. I'm sure fatigue is set in because he's not as active as he was in the early going. Mills Lane still in the bout. Cautioning none against low blows with a minute to go. So a trio of judges. 
will decide whether Michael Dunn keeps his middleweight title. I think that was a pretty good fight. I think Marlon Starling didn't embarrass himself against the bigger, younger, faster man. But the bigger, younger, faster man was just a little bit too much for him. It turned to be a pretty good performance by Michael Nunn, considering the fact that he's fighting a guy like a Marlon Stalin who's been around the block a few times. It's a tough fight. Stalin's not the easiest guy to figure out. In fact, he's one of the toughest to figure out. But he made himself a little bit easier today than we might have expected, particularly in the middle rounds. Well, you know, Jim, Stalin just got comfortable. He didn't throw enough punches. In fact, Freddie Roach's trainer just begged him to throw more combinations to be a little more physical. In fact, he wasn't. Uh, throughout the middle rounds. Starling looked as good as he's ever looked against Lloyd Hunnigan 14 months ago and Eddie Futch as trainer was the partial architect of that particular performance. Do you think he uh, do you think he may have done himself a disservice by getting rid of Eddie Futch? I think anytime you get rid of a guy like Eddie Futch you do yourself a disservice. Uh, the fact of the matter is here's a man who wants to be champion who is champion Marlon Stalin and wants to manage himself and do all the above. You can't do that. You need to concentrate on one thing. That's boxing. I'm told that ring announcer Jimmy Lennon is ready to give us the official decision. Ladies and gentlemen, at 12 rounds of championship boxing, we have a majority decision, and here are the score totals. Judge at ringside, Gary Merritt scores about 114, 114, even a draw. Overruled by Judge Art Lurie, who scores about 117 to 111. And Glenn Hamada scoring about 118 to 110 in favor of the winner. And still, IBF middleweight champion, Michael. Second to nine. So the same two judges who gave on his majority decision victory over Iran Barkley in August. Credit him with victory over Marlon Starling here. And just as that decision was booed by some at ringside in Reno, some elect to boo it here. It's tough to be Michael Nunn, unbeaten, unchallenged, unloved. Total punches in the fight, Nunn, 975 to Starling, 682. None landed more punches also, and that percentage, 32%, is way up from where it was in the first three rounds of the bout when he was uncharacteristically inaccurate. And right now, Larry Merchant stands by in the ring. Larry? All right, uh, Michael Nunn. Yeah. Michael, you've been through a lot of turmoil recently. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us how you feel about the turmoil and coming through all of this finally. Well, psychologically, I'm real tired because throughout the last two or three weeks, I had to put a lot of things behind Michael Nunn, but that proved the great champion I am. And you like to tip my hat to Marlon Starlin. He's a very tough competitor. He's knocked out Mark Breedland. He's beaten Simon Brown, the two reigning welterweight champions. And he got in you know, real good shape. And he tried to take the fight from me due to me having my management problems. But I thank the good Lord up above for blessing Michael Nunn with the skills, the willpower, determination to keep on going. And I thank my family, thank everybody back in Downport for being behind me. Why did you decide at the 11th hour uh, last night, Michael, to go back to ha having Joe in your corner, Joe Goosen. Well, you know, I felt like Joe then went throughout my career, and it wouldn't hurt because he wanted to be in there just as bad. So I thought it was a he heck of a combination. And we got together, and uh, we done what we had to do one fight, and I think that's what's important. Did you think that with all the turmoil and all the stuff going on that you just needed to have somebody in there you were familiar with to go back, going back to before all of this stuff? Well, like I say, you know, I credit a lot of this to this friction. Like I say, I was a strong guy to be able to put it behind me, Larry, but I couldn't uh, afford to pull out. You know, I hurt my back back in January, and they thought I didn't want to fight. I mean, Marlon Stone was a great fight. I mean, why should I duck anybody? I'm 35 and on the world middleweight champion. I fight the best guys out there. Is bringing Joe Goosen back into your corner an indication that you will resolve the differences and go back to the Goosens as your management? It's a possibility. I just want to go back home, get my family and friends, just kick back and relax and enjoy this victory. And uh, 
see what happens. You, say, you say it's a possibility. How good of a possibility uh, is it? It's always a strong possibility. I don't know what I, I, I just want to take some time off right now there. But what I want to do is wish my son happy birthday. Little Mike, he's here with me. Hi, Mike. Him. He's uh, nine years old. Hi. And today is my 27th birthday. So I know I couldn't get beat with my son here, my family, my friends, and all my little supporters out there. All right, two things. There's been some stories that you want to go up to the light heavyweight division, fight Virgil Hill, who you had fought as an amateur and defeated. Is that what your goal is now, to move up to the light heavyweight well, division? What I'm going to see what's out there in the middleweight division. You got Thomas Hearns out there. You got uh, Roberto Duran, Ray Leonard. You got Mike McCallum, who just knocked out Michael Watson over in England. Congratulations. There's still a lot of credible guys out there. So I just want to take some time off and get back in the gym. And uh, Well, I want to give you a surprise. You may be the last to know that Donald Curry was today uh, named as the mandatory challenger for the IBF and that you have to make your next fight against him in the middleweight division. How do you feel about that? I'm all for it. For Donald wants to fight, I mean, I'm, I'll be more than happy to oblige him. He's a personal friend of mine, but, you know, Ben is coming for pleasure, so we can get it on and do our thing here on HBO. Just one last thing. Mrs. Nunn, I understand you brought a birthday cake all the way from Davenport, Iowa, the mean streets of Davenport, Iowa. Yeah. Is that true? Yes, that's right. Mrs. Nunn, good congratulations. Thank you so much. Good show, Michael. All right, thank you, guys. Back to you, Jim and Ray. All right, thanks very much, Larry. And Michael ran down all of the options there, Ray. He talked about the other middleweight champions, Mike McCallum and Roberto Duran. He mentioned the possibility of a fight with Thomas Hearns. As Larry pointed out, the International Boxing Federation has mandated today that if none wants to keep that title, he's supposed to give Donald Curry a fight before July 17, and none said he's willing to do that. The bottom line is it looks as though he's a long way away from the kind of pay-per-view battle with yourself or Hearns that a lot of people thought he was close to a year ago. Is that about the size of it? I think with Michael Nunn, Jim, he has to go back home and reevaluate re what's taking place thus far in the past three weeks. You know, getting together his managerial problems, resolving that, and then really observing himself, see what he wants to do. He needs to do a lot of soul searching. Give him a grade on a scale of 100 today, given all of the difficulties coming in with the change in management, welcoming his trainer back into the camp last night. Where would you rank him? As far as mental stability is concerned, I give him an A. But as far as sheer performance, you know, it's like a C because he's in a no-win situation. He's fighting a little guy. Now, it, as far as Marlon Stallman was concerned, if he had won the fight, then it would have been a great of accomplishment because he beat a bigger man. All right, let's go back up to the ring and Larry Merchant to see uh, what else we can learn about what happened here. Larry? Don't remind me. You think I have something? <laughs> well, the reason that Marlon Starry is hiding here is not because he lost the fight, but because before the fight, he had stated that he wanted to win this title so much because he just hated the thought of going back to having to train in a rubber suit and lose all that weight to fight as a welterweight. But back you go because this guy just looked too young, too fast, too tall, what? Well, he's not too, uh, he wasn't too young. I think uh, when I got inside, I didn't work hard enough. Um, none is a very elusive fighter. Uh, maybe down the line I can get a rematch, but, you know, uh, I, I still the uh, best welterweight in the world, and I think there, there's another middleweight to beat me in the world. And I don't think none to beat me uh, on, a, on a rematch, you know, take nothing away from the champion. Uh, uh, Marlon, were you surprised that he stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with you? for much of the fight? No, I wasn't surprised because, uh, you know, he want to remember that he, he thinks I'm a, I'm a welterweight moving up. Um, uh, so, you know, we all have good nights and bad nights. I don't think this wasn't a bad night for me. I think Nunn just was a little busier. And so what you're saying is is that uh, he had something to do, at least, with you having a bad night, and, and well, he fought a good well, listen, fight. Listen, I'm not going to say I had a bad night. You know, you get me in the ring with any other fight in the world. Don't forget, I, I still am the best. Uh, All right. Who player. is next for you? Are you going to go for a third fight with Mark Breland, or are you going to go for a second fight with Simon Brown, two other well away champions? Brown, you beat when he was a youngster. Many people you regard him as one of the better guys. I am the best welterweight in the world, and maybe this fight can uh, lure Ray Lennon into fighting me. <laughs> you know, don't laugh at me. Now, am I a middleweight or ain't I? You are the second best middleweight in the world tonight. Well, tonight, you know, uh, I'm the best welterweight in the world. Yes, you are, Marlon. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you. Okay, again, back to ringside.